Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Coastal State discussion concerning drivers of toxic algal blooms in Narragansett Bay. My name is Meredith Haas. I'm the Science Communications Manager at Rhode Island Sea Grant, and I'll be your moderator for today. For those that are new to the Coastal State discussion series, um, the goal of this platform is to highlight ongoing coastal marine research impacting Rhode Island's resources and communities, and we hope that ultimately through this series, we can not only provide a platform for the researchers to share their work, but also as a way to um, engage conversations and further collaborations and partnerships that enhance the management of our natural resources. Um, for more information on the series, you can visit Rhode Island Sea Grant's website, where you will find information for upcoming events, as well as recordings of uh, previous events. Um, you can also join our newsletter if you would like to see um, or have updates sent to you regularly. And um, before we begin to uh, before we begin today's discussion, I just want to give a quick overview of today's format. Um, we'll have our speaker um, present their findings for about an hour, followed by a Q and A session. So we just ask everyone to reserve their questions to the end, but please feel free to share comments or questions during the presentation via the chat option or the Q&A um, option found below at the bottom of your screen. Um, and with that, I would now like to kind of introduce today's topic and our guest speaker. Um, today, we will be taking a look at a particular uh, phytoplankton species known as Pseudonychia. Um, this particular species um, can produce at times the neurotoxin demoic acid and has implications for Narragansett Bay. Um, while there have been species um, of this plankton in Narragansett Bay for a very long time, um, researchers have really dedicated research in um, recent years, given an unprecedented bloom in 2016 and, and 2017 that resulted in the first uh, baywide closure for shellfishing. This was only a precautionary closure, um, given what happened to uh, other New England states that had to recall some shellfish. But researchers have been really targeting, um, looking at this species now and what the implications for the future might hold. And so joining us today is Dr. Matthew Burton, an expert in medicinal chemistry and chemical ecology at Case Western Reserve University and formerly uh, University of Rhode Island. And he will be discussing with us his recent findings regarding environmental drivers that they believe might help promote the, spirit, the species and the production of domoic acid. And he'll also be sharing with us some um, additional work looking at harmful algal blooms in freshwater systems. So please welcome Dr. Burton. Well, thanks, Meredith. Uh, it's so nice to uh, be here with everyone. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, it really means a lot. It's um, really an awesome opportunity to get to share uh, the scientific research we've been doing. And uh, to start off, I'd really like to just say uh, how much of a team effort this is. So we've been uh, supported by um, Rhode Island Sea Grant. I'm very grateful for that. And so it's been a really nice partnership between myself and my lab members, and then Bethany Jenkins, um, who is in um, the cell and molecular uh, department and also the Graduate School of Oceanography at URI uh, and her group. So, so right, as Meredith said, I'm going to talk about drivers of uh, toxic algal blooms in Narragansett Bay. But just to give a, an introduction, uh, maybe to me, if folks um, may not may not know me or, or, or the research that we've been doing. Uh, so this is a picture from Rhode Island, and you can see I just kind of pasted over my new my new my new uh, affiliation here at Case Western. Uh, but I I loved uh, being at University of Rhode Island. Um, so it's it's nice to be be back around a lot of URI folks here, um, but now I'm at Case, but we do um, still do a lot of a lot of um, freshwater and, and marine research, looking at specialized molecules that are made by by microbes, uh, predominantly bacteria, in these systems. Um, here, this is Alexa Sterling, a graduate student who did a lot of the work that I'll show today, and we're out in Narragansett Bay on the Hope Hudner. Uh, here's a picture of me. I'm with uh, Noah uh, doing um, some work on a, a different cyanobacterial species named Trichodesmium. Um, I led a J-term at URI for, for a number of years. Uh, these are a couple of pictures of, of that in Indonesia. So I, I really like to still get out, get out and about. And then here's an older picture of my group. I'm gonna have to uh, put up a new one. Um, 
But if we talk about our, our areas of research, I'm not going to really talk at, at all about area one in this talk today, but we, we do have a, a pretty uh, significant medicinal chemistry focus. Uh, so uh, like a lot of natural product chemistry labs, we, we view uh, discovery as our lab's engine, and that's the discovery of new small organic molecules. Um, again, primarily from bacteria, but we'll also study a number of plants as well. And so uh, the way I like to describe it is if you find some, some novel molecules or some new molecules, that's, the, that's the, the gasoline that you're putting into your car, that, that's fueling your engine, uh, and then you can go and do a bunch of other things. So you can do bioassays and try to figure out if there might be a therapeutic avenue to shunt these molecules down. If we can go far enough, this has not happened too often, but a couple of times, uh, we can actually get into the chemical biology of these molecules and figure out their molecular target and their mechanism of action. Um, we are very interested in the um, biosynthetic gene clusters that are available in microbes that create these molecules. So understanding the biochemistry and the source organism itself that construct these really cool, uh, unique structures. And then I have here comparative metabolomics. I see a show a little bit of this today, but we use a lot of mass spectrometry methods to do uh, small molecule inventories um, of the sources that we're, we're examining. Uh, but the focus uh, more of today's talk will be in kind of our second area, which is environmental health, uh, specifically around um, HABs or harmful algal blooms. And so we look at both known and what we consider emerging toxins. Uh, we look at the impact of algal and cyanobacterial toxins in particular. So we may look at molecules like demolic acid, and we'll talk about this today. Demolic acid's ability to impact uh, food resources. And so the picture here, these are pseudonychus cells. And, and I'll talk quite a bit more about this, but these can get into the gastrointestinal tract of um, filter feeding mollusks like a uh, like mussel or a clam. And then if we consume that clam, we may take in the algal cell, which has, has toxin inside of it. Uh, we do a lot of time series work, uh, sets me apart maybe a little bit from, from kind of classic natural products groups uh, where maybe we move a little more into that ecology realm. Um, and we're also interested, this is a cyanobacterial toxin here called microcystin LR. Talk about that near the end of the talk, uh, and this um, is is a, a liver toxin that that affects uh, fresh uh, drinking water resources. Um, so we're really interested in understanding the triggers of toxin production in these in these organisms. This is a, a, a picture here of a Pseudonychia culture, and again these emerging toxins. So we try to use mass spec methods to find new toxins that haven't been described. And the reason that's important. It may not seem like it, oh, well, you found the third, 301st microcystin, is that so important? Um, but the, the subtle differences in the molecular structure of these microcystins actually have fairly significant impacts in how they're transported and retained in liver cells. So it's actually fairly interesting to look at, um, say, structure activity relationships and how subtle differences in these molecules actually result in pretty large toxic and biological effects. So what are harmful algal blooms? I, I would imagine um, a lot of folks on this, on this, in the seminar probably know uh, a lot more about it than I do, but uh, you know, the general thought, and especially problem in, in Lake Erie here in Cleveland, is that you have um, point sources of nutrients. This could be say agricultural runoff or urban runoff. This is typically um, moving into rivers or streams. Those are getting carried out into a larger body of water. The toxic organisms um, are residents, typically, uh, in these areas, so they are already there. And then when they're inundated with these um, nutrient pulses, nutrient source, light, temperature, different abiotic factors, abiotic factors, um, they will bloom. So they will, they will proliferate uh, into, into huge, large mats, and these can cover gigantic uh, areas, just square kilometers of area. So you can see here, this is a picture from... Um, Satellite uh, image, this is the western basin of Lake Erie, and you can see this is near Toledo, Ohio, and you can see all this green uh, covering that area. So, you know, one area we're really trying to move into um, and is, a, is of high interest for us is investigating the ecological role of these metabolites, not just demoic acid, but others that we find. And this is a really nice, um, and, and Ismi J, uh, Thurple et al, they did have a nice review here. And there's been some really cool stories lately um, of how algae and cyanobacteria use small molecules in their ecological setting. This may be for 
competitor deterrence, grazing deterrence, niche expansion, some aspect of their ecophysiology. Um, this molecule here, they call this the eagle killer. This was quite an interesting story. It was published in Science. So if, if you go to the review, you'll, you'll be able to find all the primary sources for, for these stories. Um, but this was a situation where you had a, a cyanobacteria producing this toxin. Ducks were eating the cyanobacteria and accumulating this molecule inside of them. And then eagles were eating those ducks, and then they were getting it biomagnified into them, and it was causing eagle death. So that was, it was pretty pretty nice work. It was a pretty unusual molecule uh, in cyanobacterial metabolism. You can see it's heavily brominated. It looks like, like one of those um, persistent organic pollutants, maybe. Uh, we'll talk about this copepotamide in a second. I'm um, sorry. But this copepotamide, this is a pretty interesting story here. So you have um, the production of copepotamide, by copepods, so small uh, marine crustaceans, and well, freshwater too, uh, but for our purposes, marine. And this molecule is a trigger, or has been shown to be a trigger, to pseudonychia to produce domoic acid. So the thought is that maybe uh, it could serve in some capacity as a grazing deterrent. And there are some other really cool stories uh, throughout, throughout that uh, review. Okay, so when we're trying to think about and, and kind of solve some of these ecological issues, find these drivers, why, why are these molecules really being produced? What's the, what's the real um, ecological role of them? Uh, we use a lot of mass spectrometry. So folks may or may not be that familiar with mass spectrometry, uh, but it is a way to measure, measure and infer the molecular weight of molecules uh, by turning them into ions. And people can do that in the gas phase or the liquid phase. Um, to start. So we typically use the liquid phase. So you're sending in some type of chemical extract. So if we isolate and collect algal cells, we'll extract them in a solvent. So you're pulling those chemicals out into this liquid matrix. You're injecting this liquid into a chromatography system. So that chromatography system is going to separate the molecules in that mixture. And then we're going to send them to the mass spectrometer. So that liquid is going to come in. It is going to be heated and it's going to get nitrogen put onto it and it's going to be charged. And so it's going to change from the liquid phase to the gas phase into individual ions. Those ions are gonna travel through the mass spectrometer. This is called Q1, that stands for quadrupole one. And uh, we can measure the masses. If we have uh, a quadrupole two and three, we can fragment our initial masses and then we can get fragmentation data uh, that we detect. And that gives us a deeper level of identification um, so mass spectrometry is our, our is our primary tool that we use in our in our in our work. Um, I would say overall, it's, it's the one we use the most. Um, and so folks can do this in a targeted or an untargeted manner. Uh, so targeted is looking for one thing. Uh, that doesn't mean it's easy, um, but it's a little bit easier than untargeted. So if we are looking specifically for domoic acid, we can set up that mass spectrometer like I showed Q1 and Q3. We can say Q1 just look for the protonated. Uh, mass of domoic acid, Q3, look for specifically defined fragments. So we're only going to look for domoic acid and we'll see one peak at our mass spectrometer. And that's a really good way to quantify uh, things. It's very, very selective and it has pretty good sensitivity. Uh, and then uh, another way to do things is an untargeted approach. So we do a little bit of that too, um, but you're looking at everything. So this makes things quite a bit um, more difficult. So here you can see there's one peak in our targeted now here in our target, you can see many, many peaks. And you can look at these in many ways. Here, we're just looking at them as dots. Um, and, and here, you know, folks will call these molecular feature maps, which is really just a fancy way to say, okay, these are all the analytes that are in my sample. And, uh, you know, you'll know what some of those are and you won't know what our ones are. And then that's kind of the job is to try to figure out what is what in these samples and try to establish patterns, try to establish if, if you have cultures and you, you alter the parameters of one culture. How does that affect metabolite um, uh, production? That can all be done uh, using it really either way. Um, but, but untargeted, it, it takes a lot more um, post-acquisition work. So, so kind of the bioinformatics tools that are used to make something out of uh, those data. So, okay, so I'm gonna um, kind of move into this domoic acid and the pseudonychus story. Um, and so we are looking at diatoms, and diatoms are very beautiful um, eukaryotic microalgal uh, group. Um, they are photosynthetic. They are really great for primary production, and they have these silica-based cell walls. And when I was in uh, a graduate school, I did a project on sponges, 
and you would dissolve the sponges in bleach to look at their silica skeletons. And then you would find there were like diatoms in the sponges and you would see all these like amazing shapes. Um, and, and they're just really, really beautiful. Uh, so Pseudonychia is the diatom that we're most interested in, especially for this project, has the most relevance to Narragansett Bay um, out of, of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it is a chain forming uh, group. So you can see this uh, picture here. So you have a cell conjoined to another cell, conjoined to another cell, conjoined to another cell. Uh, the predators do include copepods. We'll talk a little bit about that copepodamide story. Uh, they are capable, many of them are capable of producing a neurotoxin, this stomach acid molecule. And you have uh, 52 known species, about half um, have been documented to produce stomach acid. And so how, um, how is stomach acid affecting us? So again, you may have a muscle filtering the water. Um, the particles in that water are getting into the flesh of that organism. And if you're eating that, you may be taking in um, toxin. But it's very, very rare to have, um, have an effect here, here in the United States. Um, the first uh, documentation of this was in the late 80s in Prince Edward Island, Canada. You had four deaths at that time, and, and, and that's awful. We don't even want that. But, but there are no documented deaths um, after that incident. So that, that's uh, you know, a testament to the monitoring and, and the quality um, of the shellfish in the US. Um, and so domoic acid, what it can do is if you've taken enough of it, it has to be quite a bit, uh, you can get amnesic shellfish poisoning. And so these symptoms, uh, amnesic, uh, you memory loss, and, and lots of neurological problems. And, and I'll have a slide here showing the mechanism, but it's it's a very interesting mechanism. It basically, is mimicking glutamate um, in your cells, causing uh, calcium influx into your neurons and, and causing neuronal damage. And the ecological role isn't totally known yet. I'm going to show some slides on on some really nice data that that has some really strong suggestions, um, but but it's still a little bit of a mystery. Uh, and so you you find it. Uh, fairly globally distributed here. And um, the largest, to the best of my knowledge, so I, I, I feel fairly confident, but I'm sure someone out there can correct me. Um, the, the largest harmful algal bloom um, is this 2015 diatom bloom off of the West Coast of the United States, Canada. You can see it here up with Alaska. Um, now that's the largest harmful. I believe the largest algal bloom, you may have to quote, quote unquote that, is sargasm uh, from maybe just a few years ago. It stretched from like Africa all the way to the Caribbean. Uh, but as far as like a toxin producing harmful algal bloom, I believe this event called the blob, uh, where um, I think you had a warm water mass, if I remember correctly, came into this area, causing just a, a, a very, very high growth of pseudonychia. This was very problematic for, for sea lions. So, so mammals and birds can get affected by, by these toxins uh, just, just as we can. Uh, folks may know there's, it, it may be slightly apocryphal, but, but I don't think it's too apocryphal. <laughs> but um, the birds was inspired by a demoic acid event in the Santa Cruz area um, in the uh, 60s, I believe. So if you're looking at demoic acid here, if you, if you look really closely, and if you remember your amino acids, you have your uh, N terminus, you have your C terminus, and you have a branch point, and then you have this side chain here. And then if you look down at glutamic acid, you can see there's your N group, there's your uh, C group, there's your side chain, very, very close in structure. And so that's what's basically happening is that in your body, when you take into mulch acid, it looks like glutamate, your body kind of treats it like glutamate, it's binding into glutamate receptors, it's causing a lot of calcium to come into your cells. That calcium is creating electrical signals. You're basically overcharging your neurons, creating this excitotoxic effect, uh, and that leads to this neuronal damage and death. So when we're thinking about triggers, you know, what's known, a lot of work has gone on to this. I'm, I'm, I'm basically just scratching the surface of even what I'm showing in the wealth of, of uh, papers that you can find. Uh, but this is a pretty, um, th this was a pretty landmark study here from 2018. This is uh, Brunson et al. It was, a, I believe, a postdoc or a grad student in Brad Moore's lab. I think it was postdoc. Um, and so what this group did was they ended up finding the um, biosynthetic gene cluster that creates the moic acid. And so the way they did this is they examined some different cultures. And what they found was if they had 
um, low phosphate and a high um, carbon dioxide concentration in the water, the genes that make this toxin were highly upregulated. And so the thought was that the low phosphate and the, and the high PCO2 were, were triggers to uh, turn on those genes and get those genes to, uh, to create the molecule. But as I showed, there's also some really nice work here showing that this copepotamide molecule is made by the made by the copepods or made by maybe the symbiont and the copepods. Um, that's that's a I don't want I don't want to go on a tangent, but that's kind of a whole a whole another story of, of you know is this really invertebrate made? Uh, could be for sure, um, or maybe not. Uh, so this copepotamide serving as what they call an alarm cue and is causing. And so if you read the paper here from uh, Cylander and others um, and coworkers, you'll you'll see that when they put copepotamide in increasing concentrations into cultures of Pseudonychia, um, although that's actually not Pseudonychia, that if you have BioRender, that's I think Phaeodactylum, but, um, but you know, I guess you gotta work with what you got on BioRender. Um, but, but basically if you put more and more copepotamide into uh, the water uh, with Pseudonychia, it'll, it'll produce more and more demonic acid. So the thought is that that's basically triggering it and it's saying, oh, there must be a copepod nearby. Let me make more demoic acid. They also have shown allelopathy against other diatoms. There's even work that's showing that, say, you iron stress a culture. Um, so here you you can, uh, if you think about if you think about an iron binding ligand, uh, terms of Darafor will come up. So the idea would be if I reduce the iron in a culture, so so I'm making the iron scarce. If there were a molecule whose role was to bind up iron and bring it back into my cell. I would want to overly produce that molecule, right? Because the iron's low and I need to put a lot of this ligand out there so it can get the iron that might be available. And so what these folks did, uh, this is a little bit of an older paper, but um, they had iron sufficient and you can see there's a fairly low amount of domoic acid that's being produced in their cultures. But if they iron stress, so if they lower that iron, then you're getting a significant increase in the demoic acid. So there are many and varied really potential uh, triggers here. So when we think about our work, we're very concerned for the shellfishing industry in Rhode Island. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a really amazing industry. They, they're doing a ton of wild harvesting, commercial fishing, bunch of aquaculture farms. When I would go out in Narragansett Bay, I would see a lot of the, the lines in, in mariculture, the lines of mussels out in the bay. It was really cool. Uh, selling to all 50 states. I had my, my uh, permit to, to harvest as well when I was there. Uh, and one thing that's amazing at the Graduate School of Oceanography, we have this long-term plankton time series. Uh, goes back a very, very long time into the 50s. And so every week, someone is going out there into the bay and they are taking water samples and defining the um, algal and phytoplankton species that they see out there. And so even though... Um, as, as Meredith mentioned, you had some closures in 2016 and 2017. The resident uh, species here, so, so finding Pseudonychia, or, or I guess the genus, we, we don't know the species here in particular, um, although we did do some work on that, which I'll show. Um, but you had high cell counts of Pseudonychia, but you didn't really have the high toxin in that, in that production until uh, 2016 and 2017. And this was covered extensively in the media. And so I'm going to set up our initial objectives, talk about the methods in pretty, pretty good detail, and then get into um, some early results and then our newest results. So the overarching questions, we had two hypotheses. One was that there were residents, resident species of Pseudonychia, and their toxin production got turned on because something changed. And then our other hypothesis was that an offshore non-resident migrated in somehow due to physical oceanographic factors or, or, or uh, you know, hitched a ride on a boat or something like that, um, but that it was, was, was not a resident and came, came recently. So we were going to do a lot of molecular biology to identify the Pseudonychia strains that were in, the, in Narragansett Bay. We were going to do mass spectrometry to look at the demolic acid concentrations. And then we were going to collect a lot of environmental metadata, abiotic and biotic parameters. So we had uh, three sites. Um, the GSO time series was, was one of them. And then we had two sites in each of the passages, uh, one we called East Passage, one we called Whale Rock. 
Uh, we also had a couple of shore based sites here. We would go to the uh, Graduate School of Oceanography sometimes and over to uh, Fort Weatherall um, if weather was, was not conducive to sampling on the boat. Took the YSI, we find, you know, taking temperature, all, all sorts of different uh, parameters of the water. And then we're basically just taking a carboy, taking a bucket, putting that bucket, grabbing some surface water, pouring that into the carboy, bringing the carboy back to the lab, and then performing some different filtrations uh, to perform the rest of the experiments. So to talk about uh, the identification of the species, what are we doing? We're filtering the water, capturing it on the filter, extracting the DNA from the filter, and then we are going to amplify uh, the different Tiacon genes based on a small uh, region, uh, ITS region. Uh, and so what we're going to do is uh, put MySeq adapters onto that, um, onto these, the primer that's going to amplify that section of, of DNA. And it's going to amplify all the DNA, all the different pseudo-initiate pseudo species that might be in there. And then once you've done that, and you have all that sequencing data, you can use a bioinformatics pipeline. And that bioinformatics pipeline can actually classify those different species. And so the primers that we have are, are really good at resolving uh, pseudo-initiate at the species level. Uh, when we filter the seawater, we're capturing the diatom cells or, and other, other, other phytoplankton cells. Then that water goes through. Then we put a secondary filter in place there to capture any heterotrophic bacterial cells. And then that water comes out 0.2 filtered. And then we'll use that abiotic water for nutrients. Uh, and again, it's this ITS1 region that we use. Uh, is, and this is a pseudonychia specific marker. So it's not the whole phytoplankton community. It's just the pseudonychia species. Uh, so the demoic acid, we're filtering the water again, grabbing that filter. We're extracting it in a more polar solvent. So 0.1 molar acetic acid, that's due to uh, demoic acid has really, really good water solubility. All of those carboxylic acid groups on it make it very water soluble. And then we are going to analyze it using that LCMS method. And so we put a column in front. That column is going to separate the analytes. But again, we're using that Q1, uh, Q3 approach. So we're only finding demoic acid because we're monitoring the protonated molecule, which shows up at 312. And then we're monitoring these transitions. So we're only looking at fragments of demoic acid. So it's really uh, sensitive and, it, it's, and selective. It really gives us great accuracy. Uh, nutrients that we were we were most interested in uh, phosphate due to previous work uh, nitrate because nitrogen is 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 part of the molecule uh, and then silicate because uh, silica is is necessary for the um, diatoms to make their skeleton. So okay, what did we find uh, in in the first part of our study? So the first part we're going to look at the first two years, so uh, 2018, 2019, a little bit of 2017 is in there too. Um, and we found these seasonal peaks in DA production. So we tended to find demoic acid occurring in the fall and then in the um, later spring, getting close to summer. So September, October, May, and June. And um, if folks are interested, there's a really nice paper in Limnology and Oceanography. Uh, Alexis Sterling was the first author in that uh, that we put out. So this is showing it a little more as a time series. So we see this really nice seasonal production. So again, this is ending right about when 2020 is going to turn over. Uh, and so we see, again, the high demoic acid in the fall, higher in, in June, back again in the fall, back again in June. We sometimes see high cell numbers correlating. So here are our cells. So here's June. Cells are high. But when they're high in the fall, we don't seem to see these cells. And that phenomenon has been documented by other researchers as well. So high toxin levels, but low numbers of cells. Uh, but then if you look here in June, you can see those cells are creeping up again. And this has extended. As we extend the time series, this phenomenon really does seem to continue. So here is, now we're in 2021, June. You can see our demoic acid levels are, are rising. We see some cells. But now we move into that September, October area. Demoic acid is high, cells are low. Uh, this one in 2022 actually started a little earlier than usual, uh, closer to late April and May, and it went a little longer. Um, but again, demoic acid level high in that spring region, and now we have cells. So cells seem to correlate with demoic acid in the spring, uh, but they don't in the fall. 
We've tried to also do some untargeted metabolomics work. So we talked about that targeted. We're just looking at domoic acid. We also wanted to look at just other metabolites that might be getting produced. And this is very, very early. Uh, this has been spearheaded by a uh, graduate student in my lab, Andrew Kim. Um, but it shows some interesting, promising results. Uh, so if we break up uh, certain blooms into uh, pre-bloom periods, so before we see the cells rise, post-bloom periods, or bloom periods, uh, and so in the fall, because we don't really see those cells, we base it off of the DA measurements. We will actually see, um, at least in the fall, that the um, metabolite profiles are different in these periods, whereas in the summer, um, they tend to overlap a little bit more. Um, and so we're going to try to keep looking at this type of work. And so how, how does one do this? So basically, what do these, what do these dots represent? So um, what you can tell the mass spectrometer is, okay, um, I'm going to give you a sample. might be from the bloom period or the post-bloom or the pre-bloom. You're going to annotate every single metabolite that you can find, and then you're going to put that in a list. You're going to line that up by its precursor mass, its retention time, uh, and its intensity. And so we can line all that up together. So we're doing apples to apples comparisons, create peak lists, and then we can put those lists into um, PCA analysis, and then they can try to categorize basically patterns of differences. So when we look at the overall phytoplankton community, we, we've seen some changes there as well. We think maybe the, the, you know, there are other community members that could be driving the small molecules that we see, but this is an area we'd really like to move into is trying to look at other metabolites other than domoic acid and see how they may be affecting the, the environment uh, during these events. So that's really the domoic acid story. So if we're thinking just about the, the molecule itself, we're definitely seeing it seasonally produced with this either connected or disconnected relationship with the cells. But I think at this point, we've gone from 2018 to 2022, what I'm showing today, we're even into 2023, and this pattern, it's really consistent. September and October, May and June. So when we're thinking about, again, these drivers, we we um, this is really, I think, some of the most um, compelling data we've been able to generate. And this again is from uh, Alexa's uh, paper here in, in luminology and oceanography. But if I set the stage, uh, we have seasons up on the top here, looking at the first two years of the project. Uh, here on the left, these are all the different species that we could identify. And, and there are more, more than that, just this, but just in this figure. If you have bold lettering, that means you're a toxin producer. If you have light lettering, that means you're a non-toxin producer. All of the sampling dates are on the bottom here. And then there are periods of the high domoic acid or low domoic acid. So the warmer colors, the resin orange means high domoic acid. You can see fall, uh, uh, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer. So that pattern's there. And then the heat map here is uh, in terms of the uh, relative abundance of the pseudonychia species determined from the sequencing. So uh, we don't have the moic acid data for the 2016 shutdown, but we found that there was um, P. pungens, the toxin producer. If we look at the shutdown in 2017, that was P. australis. Now we have the moic acid data in the fall of 2017. We see pungens multi-series again, high demoic acid. We go into this winter, a period of low demoic acid, and we can see P. americana, a non-toxin producer. If we move back into the next fall, where we see the high DA again, we are finding pungents and multi-series. If we go back to the winter, low demoic acid, and there's Americana again. If we go into the spring and, and uh, started to move into the summer of 2019, we can see Pleurisecta, another toxic species. So we think that it's these species assemblages of toxin producers that are driving the demoic acid production that we see, but we are still wondering what is the trigger either to, to have these species predominate or to form their demoic acid, because there are periods where we do see those residents still there, but we don't see demoic acid. So we're, we're not quite there yet. I'm gonna show our newer data now. Um, this was a really nice, some nice work from uh, Katie Roach, which is published in Frontiers Marine Science. Uh, so she did some retrospective work. So she's looking back um, through that time series. Uh, so, so here's 2019, we're going back a decade to, to 2009. 
And you can see that there were many resident species. We were seeing them um, all the time, even a decade past, pungens, Americana, multi-series. But probably, you know, one of the cooler pieces of data I've you know, really ever seen is this right here. We think about that 2017 incident in April with the shutdown. And what do we see? P. australis. We haven't seen it before, and now we're seeing it after. So um, she did some really nice work here showing uh, the pseudo-initiated diversity in an Narragansett Bay before and after these closures, looking at how groups like Australis, and I think this is really well detailed here. Again, you don't see it. Now you see it, and now you see it after. Um, and so it really points to, we think, some support for both of those hypotheses that this P. australis somehow came into the bay in 2017, and it has persisted, but that there are also resident species that have been here for a very long time that are, are or were producing more toxin, um, probably in that 2016 event. Uh, and she continued to do some really nice work here showing uh, temperature um, limits for these, and P. australis likes it a little bit cooler, uh, and so that may explain um, why we see it more in the winter and, and why we saw it in April. Uh, and she's continued to do some really amazing work uh, here. And so what um, what she she did is she went out with the LTVR cruises uh, out in out into the um, off off the coast here into the into the continental shelf. And you have these these squares are different sampling uh, areas on a transect. And so she wanted to look at how do the Pseudonychia species out here off the shelf compared to Narragansett Bay, and could this su be suggestive of species mixing? And so she did see in the summer and the winter that there were differences. So these populations are more similar in the winter, they are less similar in the summer. And so does that mean that there's more connection here in the winter and maybe species from the shelf are coming into Narragansett Bay and maybe Australis is one of those. And so that's really where I think her focus is going to be, uh, possibly incorporating in some of the physical oceanography that we're, we haven't really, um, you know, for our groups, we haven't focused on, we haven't really had that expertise, but trying to understand um, some of these patterns. Okay, so to understand the triggers or the potential triggers, we think it's very important to understand the biosynthesis of demoic acid. So luckily that has been worked out. And so it's it's really, uh, it, it's a pretty pretty uh, beautiful biosynthesis. Uh, you know, I, I know this is an organic chemistry class, but again, you have that a glutamate amino acid. You can really see that nicely displayed here. Uh, and then this is a monoterpene. So these are, there are two isoprene units here. And then you have this uh, the DAB-A uh, connecting these. Uh, and then basically you have the cyclization event occurring, oxidation events occurring to form this fully mature isodemoic acid. Well, that was a pretty interesting part of the paper was they actually uh, produced isodemoic acid uh, in the work. Uh, and then somehow demoic acid is made. So there's somehow there's an isomerization of a double bond um, to, to, to create it. And, and that's still actually, I believe, a mystery, which, which is pretty cool. So we had um, two really uh, super talented um, undergraduates, uh, Ashlyn and Marsha, they uh, work to create um, with Bethany uh, some uh, primers that would target the DAB A gene. Uh, they were able to look at our culture library. So we've been culturing these organisms that we've isolated from the bay and environmental samples. And they've been able to amplify that DAB A gene from a number of them. And they've done some phylogenetic work that's pretty cool here. And it, it looks like um, that the DAB A gene seems to stratify by species, which which is which is you know, probably intuitive, but it also could point to some uh, molecular evolution and a really interesting understanding of how these um, you know terpene cyclases and and different enzymes evolve and, and work. Okay, so some other triggers that have been documented are the microbiome of the pseudonychia itself. So if you, um, if you say provide antibiotics to certain pseudonychia cultures, they'll stop producing demoic acid. If you take the resident microbiome of a toxin producer and put it into something that's not producing toxin, you can trigger and elicit demoic acid production. So we think that the microbiome might be playing a really nice role or big role 
uh, Julie Maurer, um, who is a master's student in Bethany's lab, she's been focused on that. Uh, she's been able to show that if you look at um, cultures of multi-series, so two multi-series cultures and four pungent cultures, um, those cultures have species-specific microbiomes. Um, and she's also showed that you can have um, an increase in, in groups, an increase in certain taxa or a decrease in taxa when domoic acid is being um, not produced or produced. So, so in, in two of these, you can see that there's a large increase uh, when domoic acid is produced and one you can see a decrease. And so again, we're kind of still, we're obviously sussing this out. We're, we're kind of at the beginning. Whoops, sorry to touch my uh, touch screen here. Um, but what, what we think, um, we think the microbiome definitely could be in play. Uh, and we're also very focused in on uh, nutrients. So I'm not showing that today. Uh, it's not quite ready for public consumption, but we're doing lots of culture work, lots of nutrient limitation work, nutrient alter alteration work. Um, so we, we, we're pretty sure that these species assemblages are driving the DA production, that there's resident species and possibly introduced species. But what's driving the formation, the persistence, and the production of these species assemblages? Still a mystery. We want to explore more nutrient regimes, the heterotrophic bacterial communities, even the wider phytoplankton communities. Grazing, you know, grazing is, I think that's a little bit of tougher experiments, but we want to, we want to try. Uh, and, and also work with physical oceanographers to understand uh, some of these phenomena better. Uh, so what are our future plans for this project? We are going to keep culturing uh, and keep doing our nutrient work. We really like the time series we've established. Uh, we think that it could be very valuable to other researchers and stakeholders. Uh, and then one thing I'm really interested in is, is co-culturing mixed species, uh, basically trying to recreate species assemblages in the lab and to see how that production may be augmented versus, say, new algal cultures. Uh, we've had some luck, uh, tireless work from graduate students. Uh, like uh, Brian Plankenhorn, uh, Julie, uh, Katie, Alexa, Riley, I, a lot of folks have been involved in the culturing. If I'm leaving anyone out, I apologize. Uh, but Marsha, I'm sure, and Isabella, uh, acknowledge folks at the end. But I mean, really, a lot of work has gone into this. Uh, so for instance, here, you can see, here's one of those chains, but you can see there's another diatom in here. And then uh, over here, we've been able to isolate those chains into unialgal cultures. If you take, um, if you just do Sanger sequencing of the 18S gene uh, here, um, we can see that this is a pungens and it's, it's, it matches with the pungens that we found in the field. Uh, so before I switch over to the freshwater stuff, I want to uh, thank everyone. Uh, thanks so much to Rhode Island Sea Grant. Also had uh, Sea Aim, all right, Space Grant for continued funding. I really big thank uh, co investigator Dr. Bethany Jenkins, Alexa and Sterley, uh, excuse me, Alexa and Riley. They did uh, the early work from the 2018-2020 period for the most part. And then Andrew Kim, Catherine Roche came on, and Julie and Brian have done a great job of kind of keeping this going. Uh, but, you know, with this type of time series, it's so essential to have really great, uh, talented, productive students who can, you know, quickly do skills transfer and things like that. We've had a ton of help from folks at DEM like Dave Borkman, uh, Lucy Miranda, Catherine Hubbard, Tatiana Rainierson, Vitul, all the folks who collected for us. Uh, different boat captains, and some really great undergraduates, Isabella, Ashlyn, Marsh in particular, but many others. So, okay, just a quick palate cleanser. I just kind of, I can't, I just can't stop showing these pictures from Indonesia. It was, I was, I was a kid. I got a National Geographic subscription when I was 10. And until I was like 30, I collected um, every single magazine. I just couldn't get enough of it. So this was my chance to go to basically a very remote island in Indonesia called Saram, where they have saltwater crocodiles and these amazing jungles and go on these boats. And I got to stay in these little huts right on the water where you could just swim out and, and, and swim around the coral reef. So that was a real dream. So, okay, switching. Uh, so this is an NIH uh, funded project on freshwater uh, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. And so again, as I, Talked a little bit earlier, these, these blooms have been really big problem in Lake Erie, especially the Western Basin. How it's been explained to me is that Lake Erie is the shallowest of the Great Lakes, and the Western Basin is the shallowest part of the shallowest Great Lake. It's also on uh, uh, the Maumee River empties out into this basin, and uh, in that western part of Ohio, you have a tremendous amount of agriculture and animal farming. 
And so those nutrients are getting into the Maumee River. Maumee River is going out to the Western Basin. And you're getting these really just, uh, just incredible inundation here of cyanobacterial cells. This culminated in, in a pretty uh, bad event for Toledo, Ohio in 2015. You had a uh, water crisis. You had a do not drink, do not use order. Uh, you had a complete shutdown water system due to the presence of this toxin, this microcystin LR. I uh, talked a little bit earlier about uh, how many different variants there are. There's over 300 variants of this toxin. And the LR part stands for leucine, which is the amino acid right here, and arginine, which is the amino acid right here. And so these toxins are variable at this position. So you might have YR, so you'd have tyrosine here and arginine here, or RR, and you'd have arginine here and arginine here. And so there are many different versions of these toxins because you can mix and match uh, these amino acids and then other, other pieces here, methylation, um, aspects of this polyketide portion. Uh, and so uh, microcystin is the major uh, toxin. It's a patotoxic, so it affects the liver. Uh, it's an interesting mechanism, just uh, bad luck. Uh, you have organic ionic transporting proteins in your liver, and those transporters will bring these toxins into that tissue. And because they're expressed so highly, those transporters are expressed so highly in that tissue, that's why it affects that organ the most. Um, and so it is a phosphatase inhibitor. So once it goes in there, it's inhibiting uh, those enzymes and creating uh, liver damage, and it can result in liver failure and, and definitely can be fatal. Uh, but there are others. There's uh, anatoxin. This is a really small uh, molecule here, but produced by anaphana and other cyanobacterial species. Uh, and you can even have lingvia toxin. These are, will give folks a dermatological effect, the swimmer's rash. And these Lake Erie heads uh, that you can see here, some a sampler. I mean, they're really, really just visually stunning. I mean, they're 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 really unpleasant to look at. They have a terrible smell. Uh, they're really destructive. And you can see again, this is a, a satellite image here of, of wider Lake Erie. So you can see it's really in this western basin here. Okay, so what did we want to know? So we really wanted to know how cyanobacterial species composition changes over a cyanohead, so over one of these cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. How does toxin composition also change over a bloom? And are there new toxins that haven't been characterized? <clears throat> and so we got really lucky. We used uh, the Roger Williams Park, uh, well, maybe maybe the <laughs> maybe the, the stakeholders of Rhode Island aren't that happy, but for us, it, it worked out pretty well. That There was a bloom like on our first day of sampling. Uh, this was at the peak of it in October, but this is one of the lakes at Roger Williams. You can kind of see there's that uh, green green scum everywhere, basically. Um, and sorry, I didn't date this. This is an earlier picture in September, and we can look at uh, the cyanobacterial cells that are there, and we can look in later November. And there is some difference. These are these bundles here, our Fani zomenon, and, and we see this in the molecular work as well. But we have a lot of cell images, and we're kind of seeing, um, seeing this, these groups change over time. And so uh, similar to the Pseudonychia work, instead of the ITS from the 18S gene, we were using uh, a portion of the 16S gene and these MySeq adapted cyanobacterial primers. We looked at three different lakes and we could chart the community composition really nicely. Um, I will say we're still working through this quite a bit. And I, we think the Snowella is actually a different uh, species. I had a meeting with some folks from uh, the Stormwater Initiative, Roger Williams. It was like an amazing meeting, some really uh, knowledgeable, talented folks. And we actually look back at some sequences and, and think this the pink one is, is another, is actually a non-toxin producer. Uh, so you know, change, we'll change that. Um, but overall, the pattern seems to be pretty consistent as in you see lots of diversity early on. You can see probably the species of most interest would be this blue, this microcystis. You see a lot of microcystis at, at pleasure, but relatively. Um, and then each, each, in each case, we're moving to this dominance by Afani zomenon. And so we were, um, we got some nutrient uh, data was shared with us from just polo. Uh, and so we did see a, no, no significant difference in nutrients during this time period of polo. So we think this is likely uh, a temperature effect. Uh, you can see we're moving into December here. There's some really nice work, a, a pretty well-known um, algal physiologist, uh, Hans Perl. Uh, they've done a lot of work with Afani zomenon and microcystis. They've definitely shown these temperature adaptations that Afani zomenon will dominate in the colder weather, grow better, whereas microcystis will not. Uh, what's interesting is that there's been a lot of work showing the allelopathic effects of microcystin small molecules on Afani zomenon, 
but not the other way around. And so that's something we're really interested in. And, and I'll, I'll, show, I'll show why in a little bit. Uh, but in each case, we end basically with the Safani Zomanov. And, um, and, and I should say that this work is done, was done by Julie as well. So she did that really beautiful uh, work on the bacteria with Pseudonychia and then this molecular work too. Uh, one of the more significant results here is seeing that the species diversity is decreasing over the entire course of this cyanohab. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty dramatically is pretty, pretty strong significance. Um, I was actually a little surprised by this, even though I kind of knew this from literature, it was still interesting to see it. The toxin production was not constitutive, uh, but it correlated with the biomass maximum or maxima at each of these lakes. And so what we did was we did that untargeted approach, and I'll show some slides on that in a second. Uh, but what we were able to do is basically fish out uh, some known toxins. We were able to dereplicate them from literature and looking at their MSMS fragmentation patterns. You can see LR and LA, these would be my persistence of concern. You have the antibetapeptins, aeruginosins, micropeptins, different cyanobacterial toxin classes. And we can see that they're not there the whole time, especially LA and LR. They're really being uh, produced around that chlorophyll maximum that we saw um, in, in each case. Uh, and so what we did uh, to look at um, other, other toxins and metabolites is we did this MSMS-based molecular networking. And so what we did, we will collect the MS1 spectra of every analyte that we can in our experiment. Now, we will do it in what's called a data-dependent way. Uh, a lot of folks do it in a data-independent way where they fragment everything. We tend to fragment more intense ions, um, but you can do it both ways. Uh, so what we do is we, we collect the MS2 fragments from our highest intensity ions. And so what we're uh, presupposing is that if you have a similar fragmentation pattern, you're going to have a similar molecular structure. So in here, we have three different ions, and we fragment them. And so we can look at these patterns. We compare the MS2 spectra by cosine function, and we assign a similarity score. So in this case, the gray box and the green box, we're considering them let's say for the sake of argument, 75% similar, but they are only 10% and 20% respectively similar to the orange box. Well, we will cluster this green and gray together into one network, whereas the orange will be clustered separately. And so this basically creates like kind of a map or like a universe of, of metabolites. Uh, so we would say that similar compounds fragment in similar ways, and we, we refer to these as fingerprints. Uh, so this is uh, totally a different project, but just to show you how this thing functions, um, here is an MSMS -MS network. We're looking over time. We're looking at two time periods, 2017 and 2019. We're trying to identify uh, metabolites. And so I want to focus on these nodes here. So that the circle, we call them a node, and that displays a precursor mass. So this is the mass to charge ratio for this molecule. But what it really represents is the fragmentation pattern um, that was created when we triggered the MS2. But it's just easier to show the precursor mass. So 421 and 419, they're connected by this line. So they're an edge. And so here's this network here. Okay, well, 421 is trichophycin B. It's this polyketide. And then 419 is this molecule, smenolactone D. You can see that they are very, very similar in structure. They're only, almost identical. Uh, this is two units smaller, and so why is that? Because it has an extra double bond here, uh, removing two hydrogens, and, and that, that's why you see the, the two molecular uh, mass units lower, but you can see that these molecules are so similar that they would fragment in similar ways and likely be connected. So that's, that's I think, a, a pretty good proof of concept for, for how this works. Uh, and so when we did the molecular networking, we, we found that there are lots of new toxin leads here. So um, to break this down, you have the three different lakes, Pleasure, Cunliffe, and Polo. Um, and if you if we found an analyte from any of these lakes, it's um, in these pie slices. So A37, which is antibenepeptin B, it was found in all three lakes. If you have a he uh, hexagon pattern, that means you were one of the 14 um, molecules that we looked at that we could accurately dereplicate in the literature. If you are a parallelogram, that means that we have evidence that you are likely known, but we could not confirm it with the MS2. And if you're a square with rounded edges, we could not identify you at all. And we are presuming that you may be a putative new toxin. Um, and so uh, other folks have shown this too, but, but these are just really, really dense, diverse 
prolific um, events for, for chemistry. There are just so many molecules. Um, and so we work with a group that has this really amazing harvesting technology. So they can harvest massive amounts of aquatic biomass. Uh, so we think we have a really, really great opportunity here to not just detect these, but to isolate them, characterize them, and then compare their liver toxicity to microcystin LR, conducting hopefully the most comprehensive SAR that's ever been done on the microcystin. So that's really the ultimate goal of this project. Um, and then what we thought, you know, it is pretty anecdotal at this point, but I thought it was still kind of cool. Polo Lake was the one place we didn't find microcystins, and it had that high, higher relative concentration of phonizomenon. So we're really interested in kind of understanding how a phonizomenon might be able to have small molecules that, that modulate microcystin toxin production or growth. Uh, we did some more PCA. So if we look here, basically, if you look at the metabolite profiles of each lake, they're very, very similar. Uh, you have a few outliers here. Those outliers are when we were seeing those cyanotoxins at their highest concentration. Uh, and if we break the bloom up into early and late, uh, there are differences, and, and but it's mostly driven by the presence of those cyanotoxins. And then this is, is probably pretty intuitive, but we wanted to check anyway. Um, as that uh, cyanobiomass increases, we see toxin abundance increase, but we also see the number of metabolites increase as well. So um, when we're talking about uh, this, I'd like to uh, sh um, really showcase Andrew and, and Julie for their work and Nana and Sierra um, as well. But we've had lots of undergraduates work on these projects and graduate students. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge this uh, R21 grant um, funding uh, also from Rhode Island Embry, uh, a new institution and, and a lot of support from NOAA. And I'd just like to thank everyone so much. I think I'm right about on the hour. Um, so I hope that's okay. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or do discussions or talk about potential collaboration or data sharing, anything. So, so I really appreciate it. Um, and I really appreciate the invite. Great, thank you so much for presenting all of that work. Um, if anyone wants to either raise their hand, I can unmute you if you wanna ask your question directly or feel free to include it in the Q&A um, option down the, below at the bottom of your screen. Um, Matt, I would say I'll start off with one question, which I think it's just for me to get clarity on the the chemical composition of domoic acid. Is all domoic acid the same or on a molecular level, level, is there one little change that's different from species to species? Or I just, that might be a quick answer. Oh, let me unmute you. Okay, I won't mute myself again. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like. Um, thank you. Um, that is a great question. Um, I, I think it's tough to answer. Um, so predominantly, so there are many different analog. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't talk about that very much, uh, but I should have. So there are many analogs of domoic acid, and those analogs tend to be. Um, uh, geometric isomers or, or double bond position isomers, basically. So double bonds are moving along that terpene chain. So there are, you know, probably over 20 of those that exist. The primary analog, if you were to look at environmental samples, cultured samples, is what we know as domoic acid. But we don't know um, very much I mean, I, I think that's a grant right there. I mean, so we don't know very much about species-specific production of domoic acid analogs. Um, I've talked with some folks on the West Coast, and their strains definitely produce more than just domoic acid. I wouldn't say that they produce the whole suite of analogs that have been characterized, but there's usually at least one or two other ones that are made at a low level. But they were made at a high enough level that they actually isolated those and they keep them as standards. So I don't know, I, I don't think I, I can't answer it that well because it's so much is unknown.
but it is possible for sure that certain strains or species could have a particular predilection to producing certain suites of toxins. I would say that that's... that's yeah, perfect. I mean, I asked that question in relation to um, this idea of um, kind of species assemblage driving uh, triggers for demoic acid production. And I'm like, well, if they're all producing the same, like, I guess I'm thinking, are they being competitive with each other? And then in which case is one demoic acid interfere with um, another species a little bit differently. So, I mean, that was kind of really what the foundation of that question was. Yeah, I think that's really possible. We, I mean, we've done so many mass spec runs and we really have not. So we, we want, we thought we were going to see these larger suites of like, like, you know, more demoic acid analogs or some people call them congeners. Um, but we really don't. You know, it's it's really just this primary demoic acid, and it's all the more interesting to know that at least the the research up to this point concludes that isodemoic acid is made. So you think you'd at least be getting, you know, like you you know, if you think about it biochemically, that isomerase, you know, you wouldn't think it would be so efficient that like every molecule of isodemoic acid is converted, right? You think you'd at least have some isodemoic acid, you know, lying around basically. We, we don't really, we don't see it. I was going to ask, is it really hard to produce in the, or to is produce and isolate in the lab to kind of test? And yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, it's really, really hard. So you just, you know, in terms of as somebody who kind of prides themselves on isolation and structure elucidation work, um, the biomass requirements in culture are pretty vast, and we don't we don't really cultivate to that biomass for isolation. Um, I think you may actually be able to get purchase it commercially. You can produce. I mean, we get the malic acid from uh, the Canadian Research Council. Uh, they have a, a reference material standard. They might have a, they might have isodemoic acid. I'm actually not sure. You may be able to get it commercially, but we it would we would have to devote like we'd have to devote so many cultures to isolating it. It would be very challenging and probably expensive. I would think too. Um, well, it'd be expensive in terms of person hours, right? Like, I mean, just to you know to devote someone to to do the grow ups. Um, it, it would take a long time to do the isolations. Yeah, I think in in terms of like the effort. It would be expensive. I'm trying to remember. I mean, the the toxin itself. I think. I mean, it's it's fairly reasonably priced. You know, from them, it's not cheap, but it's 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 better than microcystin in a lot. Okay. Um. Another question I had was you mentioned that in 217 with P. Australis, that was really kind of the first time we've seen that species within Narragansett Bay. But you had another graph or chart that lists all the other um toxin producing species and know kind of their like different timelines, I think when they were present, but did Aus was Australia like the first toxin species we saw into the Bay or some of the other ones that you noted already here before? So they, yeah, they were already here. So okay. a lot of those resident ones were already here. What's, what's interesting with the Australia picture too, is it seems to, you know, there are limitations to doing the DNA beta barcoding uh, for sure in terms of like copy number of the ATS. ITS region there, but in that 2017, I mean, you had a, a much higher intensity, so so more sequences that we deciphered were Australis, right? And so one one might infer that there was a higher presence of Australis. We haven't really seen those levels of Australis in the subsequent work. We also haven't seen any shutdowns, you know. But but you know, to pull back to 2017, we think it's Australis. And 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 so do others. I think I think that's I think if some someone from DEM, I think that's DEM's assessment too. But 2016, uh, now 2016 was also a precautionary shift, um, so it was shut down because of other regions being shut down. Right. But in 2016, that there was not you're not seeing the Australis there. You're seeing resident species. So, you know, I think Australis is obviously a species of concern, but there's definitely other toxin capable. Um, strains in the bay. Well, the other thing I find interesting about the Australis is that you noted that it prefers cooler wa water. Did I hear that right? 
Yeah, but that's not, it, it, that's, I don't know that that is, and I, Katie may be on a call and, and she she could provide, provide maybe more context. I don't think that is, I don't think that's the case for every Australis species one might find. Um, I, I, you know, I, well, I hate to qualify and I have a newborn, so my brain, like half my brain is working, but I'm pretty sure, not that I feel like that's a cop out, but I'm trying to remember. I, I'm pretty sure that Australis, that there are thoughts that there are strains of Australis that are going to be problematic because of climate change. They actually prefer warmer water. Yeah, that's what I was, that was kind of also, I'm like, oh, I just assumed some of the seasonality aspects were related to warming water. So then when you threw in that it prefers cor uh, cooler water, I was like, oh, that's different. And that could be like an eco type thing, right? Like there's, there's some temperature adaptation there. Um, but we would like, you know, in theory, it would be really nice to, um, I mean, maybe this will happen, um, is to actually work with some collaborators that we have on the West Coast and kind of do some some strain transfer and kind of see see how those operate versus how ours operate. But yeah, we that was actually, you know, that was, again, I know that's, you know, if, I, if any, uh, you know, younger folks are out there, right, that's why, and error, right, you know, folks my age and older too, that's why you got to do the experiments, you know, because like we would have just expected Oh, uh, well, this is probably how it is. But, um, you know, when we tested it, that, that didn't bear out. So kind of, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the environmental factors that could be at play. You're just kind of looking at the presence and timing of, of these different species, because it's like water temperature or potential fluctuations. And I'm trying to, I guess I'm just thinking, oh, what would be the environmental differences between that September, October window in the May and June window. And it sounds like you're now like moving forward, trying to account for all those factors. Yeah, we're trying to, it's been, it's, I mean, I can't lie. It's been a challenge to tease it out. And um, I think we knew that going in. Um, so we, I mean, we found, we have found certain correlations actually of low nitrogen uh, and more demogastic acid production. Uh, some temperature, I know folks have found salinity. I mean, there's a there's a lot to look at, and it's just been, you know, it's like um, that 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 needle in the haystack hasn't jumped out. So it's been, you know, trying to be really systematic, think about as many things as we can. And I've noted this in talks, and I think I think it would be kind of obvious. Like we're definitely not accounting for many things, right? And because who could, right? You could, it'd be impossible. We're not looking at zooplankton. You know, folks. Folks have done a lot of uh, work recently. I read a paper where they were co-locating zooplankton and phytoplankton. We're not really looking at grazing. You know, we're not really looking at physical physical oceanography. You know, so I think we're. I think we've kind of set up um, a, a really nice story in terms of like the species assemblage thing. It, it seems really clear to us, but this this like kind of taking it that next step. Uh, and that's why I'm I'm so happy to be on this call, and and we pre, you know appreciate any comments, questions, collaborations, tidbits, um, you know, kind of take that next step. And I think the culture is really the cultures are going to help us with that. Yeah, um, I had in my notes here that when you were talking about the different um, phosphate or nitrate, um, I'm sure there's some people on here who are thinking more, like with the state's recent nitrogen reduction efforts, you know. Um, and trying to figure out how much of that is linked, um, considering some of the controversy around reducing nitrogen and some, um, you know, viewpoints about changing fisheries around here. Um, and I was also like thinking, you know, not only just general chemistry changes or temperature changes, but the dynamic between when we have those transitions of when species come into the system and when they leave, like migratory species at the beginning of the, the summer season or at the end. Um, when they're just moving in and out of water um, masses and how that changes. So, I mean, it's not really a question. These are just all thoughts I was thinking of, and you pointed to all of them in your in your slide. Um, yeah, and I, I think the nitrogen, you know, we we found this association of the lower nitrogen with more production. It's a little counterintuitive, right? So, like, kind of a classic thought. So, take those microcystin toxins. Now, they are much more nitrogen rich because they're completely, well, not completely peptidic, but almost completely peptidic. So with those organisms, if you put more nitrogen into the system, you get more production. You know, here we're kind of saying, well, we saw like less nitrogen and, and more demoic acid. Well, there's only one nitrogen in there, so maybe somehow it, it's accommodating for that. 
Um, but you know, we'll have to see if that bears out in our culture experiments. What one would probably think intuitively, like if you're if you're removing nitrogen, that's not going to cause more domoic acid because that nitrogen is not going to be available. Right. It's hard well, to say. I was I was gonna ask too, like in terms of the stage of a of a bloom. Um, and I'm not sure if you already mentioned this, but do you know if it's um or have you seen any evidence about the toxicity of like domoic acid being stronger in the beginning, middle, or end of the bloom, or does that really matter? Yeah, so I would say it's a good question. I would say that it I would say it tracks, speaking from like a summer, spring, summer bloom, it, it tracks, the, the highest concentration of demoic acid tracks with the cell maximum pre pretty well. Okay. So it's not, it's not over like um, the span of a bloom. It's just kind of like, it's either. No, no, it like mimics. So I would say like, if you had a curve of cells. Sure, okay. The curve of demoic acid is pretty much right on there. It might, it's delayed like a little bit, but but very similar shape and duration. Do you know if um, uh, this production of domoic acid has any other implications or interactions with other potential marine diseases like Vibrio, but I, I think that's bacteria. So I'm just not sure if there's any other interactions with other things that are happening. Not to my knowledge, you know, so the the, the animals like the, the shellfish aren't really affected. You know we're affected, but they right. can purge, they can purge it. Um, you know I think you if you think about like uh, the potential additive effects if you if you had got if you got a pathogen and then you were exposed to toxin. I mean I think that could be could be pro problematic, but but nothing explicit. Okay, yeah, I just wasn't sure of any other uh, marine diseases or toxins that were around or maybe compounding impacts or dampening um effects of demoic acid or if we even know that yet but um i don't think i guess those are all the questions that i really had um if anyone else wants to ask the questions i guess one more thing was some of the research papers that you pointed to when um do they differentiate or get into depth about the different species that they they focus on or is it more yes i mean they do for the most part yeah so that um oh my goodness oh boy yeah the borkman paper how oh, how do i not know this i think it's multi-series i think it's multi-series is where they isolated the um or they they characterized the gene cluster okay i hope i'm right on that if i'm giving out wrong information on that i'm so sorry i'm pretty sure it's multi-series yeah so folks are pretty especially with culturing folks are pretty specific um, and and I think there that and that could you know there could be some strain dependence and and that could that could also um, be part of some of the mixed results folks have found, but it would also could be that this molecule has multifunctions. I mean, if you look at uh, you know if you look at small molecule iron binders, you know I'm, I'd bet that thing binds iron. You know it has these uh, the way those carboxylic acids are are. Um, are positioned. You know I would I absolutely believe that bind, binds iron and potentially other metals. But I also don't know that, I mean, I don't think that precludes it from being a potential grazing nutrient. Yeah, I found the aspect that you, or um, the point that you made about, I think, increases calcium production. Is that for kind of across the board? I guess I'm curious about how some of that has a toxic effect, but are there any potential benefits? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I had to be really vague on it. I would say that there, there is a long history of trying to repurpose toxic molecules for drugs. So detrototoxin actually um, got pretty far as a painkiller. Um, cone snail toxin uh, became a pharmaceutical drug. Um, so folks have looked, folks have tried to repurpose these. You know, could there be effect, effects where you need more calcium? I, I, I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but in theory, uh, you know, if you go by the old, uh, the, the, the toxin, the, the toxin is in the dose, right? You know, in, in that term, um, you could possibly find a medicinal benefit. Did you mention that antibiotics could reduce the level of, of demoic acid produced, or did I miss? Yeah. That? So if there are certain, there's work where if you wipe out the bacterial community, you're not seeing demoic acid 
suggesting that that bacterial community is augmenting. It's somehow either either signaling or providing nu nutrients in such a way as they trigger the domoic acid. So 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 a so a microbiome elicited domoic acid production. And if yeah. and if those are not there to do that. Okay. Yeah. I thought that point was interesting um, for sure. Yeah. We were really like hyper-focused on that early on and we've really kind of just gotten to where, uh, you know, Julie's done some really nice work there to kind of pick that ball up, so to speak, and, and, and try to find some new, some new results in that area. Um, okay. Well, those are all the questions that I have and I don't see any more, um, from our participants or in the Q&A. Is there um, any final thoughts that you'd like to add? Uh, well, just that, you know, um, if folks are, if, if you know, if, if folks are interested in chatting more, uh, you know, email me or, or Bethany. Um, I, it was really a pleasure to be here. Um, I really uh, like the, the Sea Grant community, the oceanographic community in Rhode Island so much. It makes me miss it. You know, being here, uh, so so in a good, you know, in a good way, in, in a nice way. Um, so so it's been it's wonderful to be here, um, and I would say that we're gonna be we're gonna try really hard to do um, a lot more of this chemical ecology work. So we're gonna be looking at different strains. We we have we we've done one thing. My lab actually has done pretty well um, in the past is using lots of resins and like sorbents. So like. We can, we can put a resin in with the media, we can bind up the molecules there, we can do bioassays, or we can do different experiments to isolate what's being produced in culture, um, and at least at the mass spec level, because these mass spec tools are getting much better. So, you know, I used to be a person who was like, oh, if you don't isolate and do NMR, I don't believe you. And, and that's really changed, you know, these mass spec tools and, and the post acquisition tools that are available and the databases that are available have made identification of metabolites way different than it was, you know, even a decade ago. Like a higher resolution or speed or both? Uh, both, both. Yeah. So speed, so you know, scan speeds for sure. Uh, resolution, I mean, like off the charts. Uh, ion mobility, the ability to distinguish isomers now in mass spec, you know, that's now, you know, becoming commonplace where that used to be very challenging. So, so yeah, I mean, folks are making some really amazing, amazing tools. I feel like I'm getting left behind. I'm having to I had to even, I had to download R and start coding. <laughs> well, um, I'll echo Marta, Marta's sentiment that you are missed here. Um, and actually this, this uh, note on, you know, furthering chemical ecology work, and you noted a lot of the other researchers that we don't have uh, joining us today, um, such as Bethany Jenkins and Alexa. And I know we have, uh, uh, um, David Portman here and Dave Ullman um, and a lot of others who are looking at these different aspects um, related to this. So maybe we can collaborate and do a much more fuller symposium and get everyone together to to discuss this. And absolutely. We've had, you know, we have done some have work, you know, um, it'd be great to expand. We've had a, like a have working group uh, at URI um, for a bit and, and, and we had some nice collaborations through that. It'd be great to, to, to widen that widen that up a little bit yeah yeah especially as um i think the time series you know I, you know everyone's um that's been such a huge play and i think it would be good um for us down the road to kind of be able to um kind of collectively talk about all the new results that are coming out and as you mentioned with the technology changing i feel like that's only gonna happen at a faster rate all right well i want to thank uh, thank you, Dr. Burton, for joining us today and sharing us with you, um, your results. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today to participate. And um, this session has been recorded, and I'll work on editing and uploading it um, to Rhode Island Sea Grant's website. So all of you will kind of get a notification of when that is available. Um, and otherwise, I wish everyone has a great holiday season. Is the time. So um, enjoy the rest of your week and weekend and the holiday season. Yeah. Bye everyone. Thanks so much. Happy holidays. Bye.